The next generation of computing is on the horizon and it is super. This field of computer science and engineering is called supercomputing. And several new machines may just smash all the records, with two nations neck and neck in a race to see who will get there first. Supercomputers are pretty different from something like your laptop. They can take up whole buildings, and they're used to solve some of the world's most complicated problems. Just by looking at them, they may not seem that different from a machine like the ENIAC, the first ever programmable digital computer. The ENIAC was capable of about 400 flops. Flops stands for floating point operations per second, which basically tells us how many calculations the computer can do per second. This makes measuring flops a way of calculating computing power. So the ENIAC was sitting at 400 flops in 1945, and in the 10 years it was operational, it may have performed more calculations than all of humanity had up until that point in time. That was the kind of leap digital computing gave us. From that 400 flops, we upgraded to 10,000 flops, and then a million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion flops. That's petascale computing, and that's the level of today's most powerful supercomputers. But what's coming next is exascale computing. That's, let's see, 18 zeros, one quintillion operations per second. Exascale computers will be a thousand times better performing than the petascale machines we have now. Or, to put it another way, if you wanted to do the same number of calculations that an exascale computer can do in one second, you'd be doing math for 31 billion years. So what the heck do we need that kind of computing power for? Large-scale phenomena like climate change have so many moving parts that are all affected by minute changes in all the other variables, and the effect of these changes need to be projected forward in time. That's a really complex situation to simulate. On the other end of the spectrum, molecular interactions between cells and drug compounds are also extremely complex. Just on the nanoscale, and computer models of these interactions allow us to see the actual mechanisms of how diseases make us sick, and how different medicines could interrupt those interactions to make us better. Exascale computing will provide us with more power, speed, specificity, and real-world accuracy than we've ever had before. It'll be kind of like looking through a new pair of prescription glasses, bringing into sharper focus everything from chemistry to genetics aircraft design to nuclear physics, even energy grid planning. But increased performance comes with increased cost. Exascale systems have price tags in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and they require huge amounts of electricity to run. And just like with humans, running makes computers hot. So computing facilities consume even more energy and cold water to cool computers down and keep them at optimum performance. Computers that are unrivaled in their power are also unrivaled in their complexity. Exascale machines will, for lack of a better word, think differently than their predecessors, so we're going to need to think about connecting their processors to each other in a different way. Not only that, but exascale processors then have to connect to memory and storage in a different way too, and both of these will have to contain unprecedented amounts of information. And from the software side, you essentially have to talk to these computers in a different way than you do to petascale machines. So if you want to take codes that were designed to run on petascale computers and now run them on an exascale machine, you got to do some major code overhaul. Which all means the dawn of exascale requires huge innovations in everything from the physical architecture of the hardware to the software programming to engineering the buildings these computers live in. So when can we expect to see these mega machines? The first exascale machine in the U.S. was slated to arrive at Argonne National Lab sometime in 2021, but it's been delayed. That supercomputer is called Aurora, and its team plans to use Intel GPU computer chips, the slow development of which seems to be what's holding things up. So the machine that was supposed to come online second has now moved into first place. That's the Frontier supercomputer, which may come online this year at Oak Ridge National Lab and will clock in at 1.5 exaflops. And in 2023, Frontier will be followed by El Capitan at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, a machine capable of two whole exaflops. 
That's a heck of a lot of power. But it remains to be seen if the U.S. will actually get to exascale computing first, because China is also bringing three new exascale machines into the spotlight, and may very well get there before anyone else. Because even though the U.S. and China are leading the pack, many other countries, from Japan to places in Europe, also have exascale machines in the works. Again, the machine hardware itself is really just the skeleton of exascale computing. To actually bring that maximum power to bear on some of the most complicated problems scientists are trying to untangle today, there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes. Into the regional data center where our high-performance computing cluster is installed or being installed. Doors. And in the data center is right here and then put your hand in there, it reads that. Then you can come in. And these are the Cray, the high performance computing clusters that we got. Uh, as you can hear, they're very loud. Uh, they run at very, very high speeds. This rack are mainly what are called compute nodes. As the middle is here, this one's a high memory node, and these are more compute nodes over here with a large file storage node. And if you want to see the backs of them, they basically look similar to this. Uh, we're the first university in the United States that's running the HP hardware with what uh, Cray calls Slingshot. That's a very, very fast way to get data to and from the servers. Uh, basically, uh, that speeds up the entire cluster by a significant margin. Uh, if you do notice the power cords, they do draw quite a bit of energy. Uh, there's two for each rack, so there's six total. They have their own air conditioning or air handling, air cooling unit that none of the other ones have on. So what are these mainframes that we keep hearing about good for? Have any intention to start programming or install stuff? They just want to know what these mainframes are. And this is what this video is about. Mainframes are at the, at the very basic just giant computers like this one. Just one computer. All this racks you see out there this is just one part of one computer this is not many computers which is here in the lower left corner where it says 390200 that is the cpu just the cpu and all these other devices you see here in the background these are all disk devices but it is one computer and that is a mainframe so mainframes are in the very essence centralized computers run by businesses or governments uh, they have been around for a long time, over 50 years now. In fact, the very first computers created back in the 40s and 50s were mainframes, where there would be uh, one computer accessed by many people. In fact, the notion that every computer, every user, every, every person should have a computer or more than one computer, what you see here is how a modern mainframe made by IBM looks like. Again, this is just the processor what's called the central processing unit and then there would be many many uh, devices here that you cannot see behind this one where the data is stored where many petabytes many thousands or millions of uh, gigabytes or terabytes of uh, storage is being kept online and accessible for programs to process them like credit card transactions or toll booth uh, records or your tax records, those would all be stored on a mainframe. And so this is how a mainframe looked in the 60s. Okay, not much different, just the looks a little different and, and it's black and white. And the guy here seems pretty happy to be working on a mainframe. But so this this is these two photographs are here to show you that there's been an undiscontinued, so a continuous line of 
computers that have been processing business and government records for the last 60, 70 years. And the most amazing thing about this mainframe is that whatever programs used to run 50 years ago still run today. Now, of course, one of the first questions, it's, it's human, it's normal to ask about any new environment or computer system is, uh, what does the user interface look like? And so uh, this, what you see on your screen here, is would have been the very typical user interface for people working at, in this case, I guess it would be at a university. What do we mean by that? From the 60s until maybe the end, the early 90s, this is how people work with the terminal. It was a rather bigger screen, with a, often with a detached keyboard. This is an IBM terminal, and this is a caller terminal, which was already an innovation that came maybe about mid-80s or end of 80s. Uh, I myself worked, when I started working with mainframes, I had just green as a caller and there was no differentiation whatsoever you had